sorry to be here, uh, primarily because the fact that I'm here uh, is a result of the fact that Jennifer Urban, who uh, Robert Pinsky was, was mentioning frequently uh, in her work on these issues, was un unfortunately able to make it, unable to make it because of a family illness. However, I am incredibly grateful to be here uh, to be able to introduce uh, this issue uh, and our distinguished panel. So, uh, beginning with uh, Susan Tishi, uh, who is the author of four books of poetry, most recently Gallo Blast and Bone Pagoda. She's currently at work on a mixed genre book of poetry and nonfiction collage for more than 200 narratives, poems, and historical documents. Uh, she's been teaching at the graduate writing program at George Mason University since 1988. We also have David Benza, who's the author of a book length poem called The Interlude. He's also the executive director of the Association of Writers and Writing Programs. Uh, AWP is a national nonprofit literary organization for teachers and writers. Amongst their many program areas, they also publish the Writers Chronicle, which, uh, in addition to providing information about grants, fellowships, and conferences and publishing opportunities, it also features critical essays. Uh, and interviews and news on the literary scene. Casey Smith is the Assistant Professor of Arts and Humanities at the Corcoran College of Art and Design. He is writing poetry and literary history. Uh, his scholarly writing and, and his poetry has uh, appeared in various traditional and non-traditional media. And uh, I think his current course deals with a lot of uh, interactions between new technology and new forms of distribution and, uh, and poetry as well. And finally, Peter Yazzie, uh, who teaches domestic and international copyright law at American University. Uh, he also teaches law and literature. Since 2005, he's been working with uh, Pat Ofter Heidi at American University's Center for Social Media on projects uh, designed to promote the understanding of fair use by documentary filmmakers and other, uh, other producers of creative works, including uh, recently, uh, as of last year, a code of best practices and fair use for poetry. Um, so I think that this topic uh, came about uh, in part when I saw Robert Pinsky speak on it last year, and in part because of uh, the work that Peter and Jennifer have done in creating the code of fair use. And I, I also wanted to, to point out, uh, I think, late last year in the fall, uh, an article by David Moore, uh, a poet and a critic, uh, uh, that appeared in the New York Times. And he was basically lamenting a lack of attention to copyright in poetry, uh, that we hear about uh, controversies in the music industry and the movie industry about it. But when he, when he produced a book on appreciating modern poetry, he had to pay $20,000 uh, for clearance and licenses when he was describing and criticizing poems. And he talked about the uncertainty and fair use. So I think to lay out the background on some of these issues and sort of what uh, the world of copyright might look like to a poet as, as a poet, as a critic, as a teacher. I thought we'd start off uh, with Susan. Susan, yeah. Thanks, Sherman, and um, thanks to Public Knowledge for adding poets to the mix this year. I was told not to expect poets in the audience. Are there any here? <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I sort of conceive of my role as actually talking about poems. Um, and what poets are doing. Um, I, in a little while, I think we're going to be talking about some poetic works that can test all of the categories for this panel, authorship, ownership, and even poetry. But I want to start by talking about what is flourishing closer to the heart and to the center of contemporary poetry. For most of us, any challenge to fair use that arises from our work arises as a byproduct of the creative act. It's not a deliberate provocation. But even so, it's not detachable. You know, uh, method and meaning are not separable, and poems often create enough ambiguity and contradiction that it's hard to distinguish origins and it's hard to codify uh, a legal nightmare, in other words. Um, leaving aside illusion and quotation as we've always known them, I think you can sort of divide poetic remix and repurposing into two basic gestures incorporating fragments from a number of different sources, whether literary or non-literary, into a new work, or the opposite gesture of in really intense communion with a single text. Poems that bring in fragments of various origins are perfect exemplars of Bachelard's famous metaphor, um, 
comparing created work to the way a bird builds a nest out of its environment, as opposed to something it might bring out from within itself. And most poems that do that collect such small bits of language that fair use is easy to assume, as at least it's easy for poets to assume. We'll see what Peter says when it's his turn, um, even when you're quoting from a poem. But as a reader, you can't always know when you're reading a poem like that. Um, typography is not consistent. Typography affects the pace and the texture of the poem, the tonal register, how you read it aloud. So when poets are making decisions about how or if to mark borrowed text, um, those decisions are not made solely along lines that would please a lawyer. Um, wouldn't even please your college composition teacher. Um, so if I take my own work over the last 10 years as an example, um, I've been writing about war and grief, and I have quoted everything from traditional ballads to essays about Abu Ghraib to other poets. And there's a kind of mosaic effect in many of the poems, and it's a texture that's meant to be there, it's meant to be palpable. But punctuating or italicizing every one of those pieces would render the surface, if not unreadable, then certainly impossible to read you know, very meaningfully. And things are muddied even further when the poem's syntax is designed to slip. In other words, providing multiple possibilities for where to draw boundaries uh, between phrases. So in that kind of a poem, if part of that was quoted, where would you say the quotation stopped and something else began? Um, perception, deception, representation, re-representation around issues of war and grief, that's exactly what I've been writing about. So the method is part of the inquiry. A much more radical project than mine is, a, is Noah Eli Gordon's recent book called The Source, which is composed from individual words and short phrases from page 26 of almost 10,000 books in the Denver Public Library. Um, in his words, a testament to the connectedness and mutability of all writing, as well as an exploration of the notion of origins, both textual and spiritual. That's a hell of a bird's nest. But when you start reading it, as my students were very quick to point out when I taught, you immediately know you're reading a book by Noah Eli Gordon, just as you know when you look at a bird's nest, what species built the nest. But it does keep that newly made thing continuous with its environment, and which makes it a kind of camouflage. Camouflage works by confusing categories, the categories and and or. Is it mine? Is it yours? Is it both? Um, and so this becomes a politics as well as a poetics for a poem that originates out of shared discourse and from which and its material identity, its actual language identity, never completely separates. Um, for obvious reasons, current law has the, the greatest impact on poetic works that interact with a single text and dictates that most such books rely on sources in the public domain. I went through my shelves and I couldn't find any um, that, that were anyone tried to do this kind of work with something under copyright. So I found examples like Travis McDonald's book, The O Mission Repo, which is an erasure done from the 9-11 Commission report. Um, Norbisi Phillips' Song, which is a 182-page book made entirely from the language of an 18th century legal decision about the murder of Africans on a slave ship. Um, Mark Nowak, a working class poet who does documentary poetics. He uses print sources and field ethnography. Um, Dan Beachy Quick's book, Spell, does have a literary source, but it's Moby Dick. Um, and the classic erasure text uh, that sort of launched the whole concept of erasure in poetry was Ronald Johnson's book, Radios, which was created out of Paradise Lost. And from within it, using its own words, created an alternative spiritual vision. So clearly it couldn't exist um, in any other words. Uh, John Cage's practice, roughly contemporary with Johnson, of um, writing through a, a text um, was barely considered writing, let alone poetry, when he was doing it a few decades back. Um, he used a masostic form and some arcane numerological methods to pull text randomly out of the cantos and Finnegan's Wake and other uh, iconic, iconic texts. Um, but times have changed so much that in 2003, my student Peter Streckfest won the Yale Younger Poets Prize 
with a book whose longest poem was constructed using very similar methods. You can tell from the name Yale Younger Poets Prize, this is a mainstream poetry mm -hmm. event. Right? <laughs> um, so this reflects my interest, you know, the list I've just given you, but also the legal climate. And not even a poet could believe that he was going to fly under the radar making a project like this out of a book that's under copyright. So um, and you'll notice in my list that John Cage is the only one who dared to mess with something. The poetry is still under copyright. These are all stunning books. You should read every one of them. But what I really started wondering when I was preparing for today was um, what my shows might look like if the law were different, if practice were different, if it didn't have this fear hovering around the quotation of poetry. And I also wonder what might have been written already that hasn't been published. Thanks very much. Um, I think, David, uh, as somebody who works with uh, young writers as well, as well as, a, as well as an author yourself, um, I would love to hear sort of what you, know, what you think and what you've been seeing uh, and how you've seen young writers uh, interact with, with this intersection between the law and writing. Uh, a few years ago, I was invited to uh, a public knowledge by Gigi Sohn and had a conversation with Gigi uh, Bradford. And the concern was over broadening and deepening uh, the intellectual commons, you know, what is in public uh, domain. And a lot of the things seemed like good ideas to me, uh, limiting uh, copyright for authors uh, so that that work can be used by educators and have a much wider uh, dissemination. And then I thought, well, uh, I better see how my field actually feels about this. And so I just randomly polled about a dozen writers about how they felt about the extension of copyright. You know, should your children benefit from your work as a poet? Uh, should your grandchildren benefit? Should your great-grandchildren benefit? And what I found was that uh, people were very passionate about the issue, but they were also all over the map about the issue. And I tried to resolve for myself what was behind the divergent reactions to limiting com copyright. Because the writers I talked to did not feel like Robert Pinsky and just one generation of support from my poetic output is um, a sufficient enough gift to my family. Some felt, well, it's my work, and if I want to take care of, you know, <laughs> all of my spawn forever, you know, that should be my privilege uh, uh, to do that. And it seemed to me that there were four forces pushing uh, these artists and educators in different directions. And um, I also found that there was a lot of chronic ambivalence in people, because my association is an association of uh, poets and writers who teach in higher education. So the educator in them felt one way, and oftentimes the artist in them felt another way. And among the artists, there were diverging views still because some have the aesthetic of uh, Susan Tishy and then others uh, have more proprietary uh, views of individual enterprise and art being a product of uh, individual enterprise. So I sort of, in trying to find out why people had these different views, I tried to look at the forces pushing that. And I came up with these four forces. Uh, one was the consolidation of publishing houses. Uh, another was the inflexibility of literary estates. Uh, a third was the World Wide Web's cataloging and indexing of everything, which has really changed the literary environment and how we work within the literary environment. And, uh, the fourth was a kind of age-old issue, and that's the dispossession of the poor and the unincorporated. 
and of course poets are extremely <laughs> poor and unincorporated and proudly uh, unincorporated. And the educators were very concerned about the first of these forces, the consolidation of publishing houses. What were formerly private family businesses like Farrar, Strauss, and Drew, and uh, all the other great houses, um, there seemed to be more discernment and even shrugs about the use of some of the poet's work uh, subsequently. But with the consolidation of publishing houses and rights being granted from one central office of lawyers that did the work for all the publishing houses, the requests for permissions uh, were harder to fulfill and getting exceedingly more expensive. Uh, the writer Francis Mays, who many of you know from uh, the movie about Tuscany based on her book about her uh, life in Tuscany, uh, before she had that fame and fortune, uh, she was an educator and a uh, uh, anthologist. And when she tried to make her anthology, Discovering Poetry, the uh, estate of T.S. Eliot wanted $1,200. This is in the 1980s uh, for the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, and they wanted roughly $4,000 for the wasteland. As a result of these high demands, those poems fell out of anthologies. They fell out of the classrooms. You know, how is that representing the good interests of T.S. Eliot? And how are we as educators to disseminate our love for poetry when we can't teach the poetry we love most? Uh, so the educators and people thought, yeah, limited copyright, that's a good idea. We need to get these poems back into the, uh, the classroom, back into the public domain uh, where they belong. Uh, Rita Dove just published uh, the Penguin Anthology of 20th Century American Poetry. The uh, book just came out this year, same problem. Uh, Sylvia Plath's poem, Daddy, does not appear in the anthology as much as Rita would have loved to have that poem in the anthology. And Howl by Allen Ginsberg does not appear in the anthology because uh, the rights were just too uh, expensive. And oftentimes, someone editing an anthology has a limited budget of $10,000 to secure permissions. If you have a budget of $10,000 and they're asking for $4,000 for the wasteland, you can readily see the, uh, the problem there. Um, so, David, uh, I just I don't mean to cut you off. Sure. Hopefully, we can come come back to uh, your main points of discussion. But I, I think that's a great segue uh, onto onto Casey, who's actually you know who uh, in teaching his class is uh, uh, addressing a lot of these issues about uh, anthologizing distribution and also new technologies. Right. Um, thank you, Sharon. Thanks for everybody for coming and public knowledge. And what a treat it is to talk about poetry in a room full of people who aren't poets. I don't know if this ever happens. <laughs> I guess it's, it's really great. Uh, for me, um, making poetry or constructing poetry, it might be worse better than writing for my practice, which in some ways is like Susan's, in some ways probably further extreme, and, and teaching um, are pretty congruent. It might be because I teach at an art college. and I teach at the Corcoran, where an art college is different in fundamental ways from most universities because kind of everything is permitted. Um, and then you kind of wait and see after that. We hear um, you know, questions from students all the time uh, in photography and video about appropriation. You know, can I do this? Will Disney come after me? You know, and our faculty is of a widely divergent response. Most of them are saying like, yeah, See if you can get Disney to come after you. That would be good for your career. <laughs> yeah, good move for you. And, uh, and what's the harm? Really? Uh, when it comes to poetry, I teach a course that's called Poetics Off the Page. 
uh, the third iteration of it. Just yesterday we had uh, an event called Letter Fest, which is a celebration of words and sounds and letter forms, kind of the poetry that comes off of the, um, the Gertrude Stein kind of end, not the Robert Frost end of American poetics. In, um, and in this course, uh, I challenge my students to open up their minds to what poetry might be. You know, maybe it's not the, what they have in mind, kind of a, a church basement or what they, grandmother's favorite poem or something like that. But to see language as an alive, you know, like, what is poetry? Which is still a great question. A question that I think is still unsettled. It's, we've learned that it's not about lyric subjectivity alone. It's not the poet. So if I, in one of my poems, I use a first person pronoun, a lot of people might be confused thinking that that poem, that it's autobiographical. Whereas that I in the poem is a is an authorial construct, and um, so a lot of my poems and a lot of what I teach my students and hope that they can accept or not. A lot of them are very skeptical. Uh, uh, we'll probably uh, find room to talk about the work of Kenneth Goldsmith. Uh, he's the originator of Ubu Web. In some people's minds, he's the arch pirate. He's the one who's taking everything. He's got his position is that, and that's one that I find very compelling is that. Uh, I don't know those poets who are making lots of money off their poetry. I guess they are out there. Uh, they're not in my acquaintance, certainly. Um, and Kenny's position is that he wants to get the work out there. And that's what's foremost. He does get the cease and desist and the take down notices. Um, and he will comply, reluctantly. But he will comply. Um, but the important thing, I think, um, and I, you know, again, I stress this to my students, is to see poetry as a field of possibility, not as a field of limitation. And so if they can think that a poem might be constructed out of a shopping catalog from Sears, or might be constructed out of studying adjacencies in a, some kind of database. I've done some poems based on classic, uh, you know, so-called classics of literature, Jane Austen novels and stuff like that. And just by doing very simple kind of search and find um, processes, uh, you know, study adjacencies. What, how did Jane Austen, what, what words came after the word law in Pride and Prejudice? Let me make a list. Let me see what I can do with that. It might, might be nothing, really. But I'll wait and see. Like my bird's nest is, uh, is a crazy bird's nest. It comes from all over the place. I think that right now, in 2012, is a brilliant time to be a poet. I think that the world is pulsing with possibility. Uh, Peter, the document is so useful and helpful. I've, I've shared it with my students. I made a joke earlier. That, um, I, I hope it's under fair use. I kind of condensed <laughs> the code of best practices to fit on one sheet of paper. Um, but, but students are, you know, they're, they're they're willing to understand. They want to understand the law, what what's right and what's wrong. They're not um, going into it with just um, kind of wild eyes. Um, but they're also concerned in the making, and not so much about what happens after it's made. And so I think that's also a healthy position for kind of any creative person to be in, to be honest. Maybe, maybe that's a good start. Okay. Thanks. And uh, I think finally for initial presentations, uh, let's turn to, to Peter. I think if you could, uh, uh, you know, I may put a legal frame on, on some of the issues that, that uh, our other panelists have raised, and also uh, talk about the document. Okay. The best, uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to do a little of each. Thank you. Sure. And, and in case you let me repeat my challenge, I think it's great to get it on the one page, but next we need the wallet card. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we, we, we poets know you're right. We can, yeah, we can collaborate on the wallet card. Uh, I mean, broadly speaking, in this in this domain of practices, in many many others. Fair use is probably the, the one bright spot in an otherwise pretty dismal copyright landscape in which stuff gets protected more and more for longer and longer and with no natural end in sight. And so this escape valve in the copyright system, which is a, a, a picture that got built into our law very early, although it didn't actually get incorporated into the statute until the 1970s in Copyright Act, has just got more and more important in, in the last few years. And unfortunately, the courts have taken up that, um, that theme 
in the fair use jurisprudence, the case law, the decisions of the last 20 years, and they've really changed in a very, very profound and, and for all kinds of cultural practitioners, very important way, the, the basic analytic rubric for thinking about fair use. It used to be that the way you did it was to, you know, by the numbers, section 107, there are the four factors, and you count, and you see, it's all very confusing, very vague, and hard to predict, uh, but open-ended, oh, the open-ended part is, is good, right? Even though all of the confusing stuff one could do without. And then, as I say, starting 20 or so years ago, courts looked at this picture and said, well, we probably can do better. We can probably provide a clearer algorithm or, or rubric for thinking about this stuff. And what's happened over those couple of decades is in effect, now fair use reasoning is different in cases of, ad, of value added practice of the sort that we're talking about here. Now what really courts do is they ask two questions. They say, is, is this use a transformative use in that it adds value to the material that was assimilated in that it uh, represents that material in a, in, new per, in a new way for a new purpose or to a new audience? And then they ask him, is the amount that got taken appropriate to the transformative purpose? And if the answer to those two questions turns out to be in each case, yes, then by and large, the inquiry is over and the use is fair, which means incidentally, not just that it's allowed, but that it is deemed non-infringing. Fair use is something you get away with. Fair use is a right. And a fair use is a non-infringing use, not an infringement that's somehow been forgiven or, or privileged. So that's really important. And that shift in the way courts talk about and think about fair use is one of the sort of two main pillars of the project that my colleagues and I have been working on with different practice communities, including happily the poetry community over the last uh, six or seven years. The other pillar is a very important scholarly insight attributable to a guy named Mike Madison, who teaches copyright at the University of Pittsburgh, who was one of the first scholars to read all of those fair use decisions from the earliest times to the present day and to distill some generalizations from them, including the generalization that when courts, who after all have the last word on these questions, when courts ask, is something a fair use or not, especially in an area that they're not familiar they look to the field for information about what's considered appropriate, about what's considered good practice, about what's considered important to the fulfillment of whatever mission that field is devoted to accomplishing. In other words, what practitioners think, and especially what <coughs> practitioners can say about their consensus values around fair use is actually important. It actually is constitutive of law, as well as simply uh, reflecting an understanding of law. Another way of putting this, of course, is that fair use is one of those branches of law that's too important to be left entirely to the lawyers. So <laughs> with these twin insights that the law is changing and that professional consensus matters, we've gone about this series of exercises facilitating a process in which professional communities come together, identify recurrent situations in which the question, is this a fair use or is it, it comes up again and again in practice, and helping, and I stress helping, those communities to develop sort of center of gravity positions around those issues. I say center of gravity position because no group of representatives of a community, and we often talk to always talk to many dozens and sometimes several hundreds of the representative practitioners in the field in coming to one of these statements of best practices. No group of that size is always going to agree about everything. But often there is going to be a substantial middle ground of agreement and that's what these statements of best practices try to document. They're especially powerful when the people who come together from the field to create them are already, as, as both Susan and David have pointed out, on both sides of the issue. And that is obviously the case and was the case with the poets who 
Pat Osterheide and Jennifer Irvin and Kate Coles and I helped to work together to create a statement of best practices. Why? Because poets are original voices and they're also engaged in a wide range of assimilative practices and have been for a very long time. And, and also, most working poets are also working something else's. Teachers, critics, journalists, archivists, the list goes on. And often they have perspectives from their other, from under their, their second hats, so to speak, which are in, which complement, I don't want to say opposed, but complement their poetic perspectives. So we, we went through this exercise as we've done before. The document exists and can be found in various places. The place you can always get a free download of this document is centerforsocialmedia.org. If you, uh, the Fair Use tab, if you go to the Poetry Foundation website, which, which deserves consideration since the Poetry Foundation funded and, and helped to make this possible, although AWP was a big help too, it has to be said. Um, unfortunately, if you go to the Poetry Foundation website, you get all sort of tangled up with Scribe D, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Center for Social Media .org is a nice place to get clean, free download of this document, and I urge you to do so, because I can't begin to talk about all of the details, although I'm happy to discuss some of them later if there are questions. But there is one thing I want to address, actually two, that came up in, in, in Susan's remarks. First, without regard to the code, but just as a matter of sort of general law, speaking back to that issue of transformativeness analysis in fair use. I don't think there's any reason to suppose that a poem that, is, that incorporates large numbers of quotations needs to mark or italicize those quotations in order for them to be considered fair use. To the contrary, I might make the argument that the poem in which those quotations are assimilated more fully rather than marked off as being something else and from another source is actually a more transformative exercise for that reason. Likewise, the practice that we're talking about, now, now what I want to talk about a little bit is the, the single author uh, response, your, your wonderful word was, was intimate encounter between a poet of now and a single work of the past. That's one where I think poets now need to pull up their socks and recognize the rights that they have, rights that they won't actually be able to claim until they exercise them. Why? Because there's actually, absolute. I, oh, I'm sorry. Of I, course. I, I don't want, but actually, I think it'd be really interesting. And Susan, if, if you could, if you would respond to, to Peter's well, first question. Well, could I just say yeah. a couple of things that I want to okay. say in conclusion, and then yeah. I'd love to hear from Susan because I just have about a, a minute, minute more to say. And one of the things I want to say is that there is nothing in the the off-the-shelf jurisprudence <coughs> of fair use that suggests that a new poem that is a response to a single work would be treated any less favorable in fair use analysis than a bird's nest poem. The other thing, for what it's worth, is that principle number two of this document clearly and explicitly covers that case and contains no reservations whatsoever with respect to the number of kind of sources. The greatest misunderstanding that poets and others, naive misunderstanding, that poets and others have about fair use is that somebody is out there counting words and that everything turns on extreme brevity of quotation. Nothing in the case law, and certainly nothing in this document, supports that conclusion. End of, end of discourse. Well, where did the 10% then come from? Yeah. Oh, the urban folklore of copyright. You know, ain't it great? Um, I mean, I could go on, but one answer is that the 10% has, has, has many parents, but one of, the, one of the less respectable of those parents is a document called 
guidelines on classroom photocopying that was issued in conjunction with the legislative history of the 1976 Copyright Act and represented, in effect, a, a failed effort to bring publishers and teachers together to agree on a safe harbor for classroom fair use. And it does have a 10% number in it. Now, I could go on and on, in the next 25 minutes I could do, on why one shouldn't pay very much attention to the 1976 classroom guidelines in the original context for which they were suggested and certainly beyond that context. But I, I'll, I'll restrain myself, except to say that in the context that we're talking about, context of poetic practice, the context of critical practice, it has no bearing whatsoever on the, the, the proper outcome. Now that said, there are still issues. There are things that the poets who got together to create this document couldn't agree upon. And one of those was the practice of making anthologies. So there is no principle here that addresses anthologies, although there's some text in the document that helps to explain the pros and cons of that argument. Does the fact that anthologies aren't represented in the document mean that it was anyone's consensus conclusion that fair use isn't an available basis for creating an anthology? No. It simply means that there wasn't a clear <coughs> consensus on that point. So I want to be able to throw it open just for some back and forth between our panelists. And just to throw out a couple of things, you mentioned uh, Ken Goldsmith, and uh, I'm sure that uh, there's a, a fascinating discussion to be had there. Uh, and also the question of nobody's counting words. I know, David, in, in our emails back and forth, I think you mentioned the fact that there were, uh, there were, if not judges and if not poets, but certainly some people were trolling uh, as plaintiffs. So. Uh, any and all of these topics, fair game. Uh, poets can assimilate other poets' poems without penalty, because there's usually no penalties when the poor steal from the poor. <laughs> <laughs> now, if a poet were to assimilate a chorus of a popular song, even if it's a bad chorus, like I'm just the miner for a heart of gold, you know, a bad extended <laughs> metaphor based on a cliche. <laughs> uh, that poet would probably find himself or herself in trouble because now that the web is here and if that poet were to publish that work on the web, or if somebody were to type up the poem and publish the poem in a blog, and the estate of Neil Young were to look for protecting that work, they would be in trouble. And the music industry does look for violations of this. Uh, and, and I am not quite so pessimistic, I must say, about this this call. Because you're absolutely right. There's there's there is trawling going on all the time. Cease and desist letters are cheap. In fact, there's even an argument that if you're a lawyer working for a copyright owner, you ought to write a cease and desist letter, that it's a part of your ethical commitment to zealous advocacy to do so. And cease and desist letters are typically the last word ever heard from the copyright owner if the user has the information base the strength of will and the support network necessary to stand up. Well, the information base is here. The strength of will we have to produce for ourselves. The support network is everywhere. I could name for you 10 lawyers who would take that Neil Young case pro bono. They would beat one another off with sticks in order to be able to represent the poet you described. There is no shortage of support. Both, uh, you know, I run a clinic in a law school. There are dozens of these intellectual property and, and cyber law clinics going around the country, hungry, hungry for cases to bring. There are a lot of equally hungry young lawyers who are looking for ways of making their names. And there are plenty of old lawyers 
who still have some principles and who have time on their hands and, and want to do good in the world. So I tell you, you know, you're absolutely right. There will be cease and desist orders, but more than that, I don't know because the last thing that any copyright owner wants to do is to test a dubious claim of rights against a strong fair use defense. Why? Because if they lose, they're in a much, much, much worse position than what could begin. <laughs> so, it seems like actually, when we were discussing some of these issues earlier, you were you were uh, commenting on the on the code and saying that uh, you were concerned that you know, whereas it seemed like there certainly was consensus in, in amongst the writing community on these things, uh, you weren't so sure that this would extend to the publishers. Um, well. Yeah, I was saying that, but that's just my ignorance, and I'm just really well, happy to be sitting next to Peter and hearing these things. Can I speak to that? Because it's such an important point. In the past, efforts have been made to get to do these sort of wonderful all-party negotiations in which every, you know, the lamb and the lion negotiate over the nature of fair use in a particular field. And they are, without exception, from the 1976 classroom guidelines that I mentioned earlier to the kung fu debacle of recent years, dismal, tragic failures. Why? Because as a practical matter, the rights holders have no impetus, no motivation to negotiate in good faith in those situations, period. So we can't now begin to think of the way in which creative practitioners inform themselves as being somehow based on an all-party consensus. The Madison Insight, on the basis of which this document and others like it are premised, is that you don't need to have everybody at the table. What you need is a good, balanced, cross-sectional representation of the field itself. And that's what's here. So I think that's what's really interesting about what that document does and how we can take these ideas, and as, we've seen in, as we've seen in other panels, where you have uh, maybe a normative framework, an ethical framework that isn't necessarily reflected in the law, is where you can fair use provide a means to sort of import that framework into, into copyright law. But um, since, since Casey, you brought up Ken Goldsmith, he has a website, ulueweb.com, and he will take uh, in copyright uh, but uh, out of pub uh, uh, but out of print works and throw them up on his website and he says that you know the minute he hears that uh, that they're in print and that they're available to people he, you know even if they're in print he says that they're available at some exorbitant price that you know only somebody with thousands upon thousands of dollars can actually buy one uh, he'll take them down so I, I was wondering if if, if, uh, if if you could comment and then actually if, if uh, everyone could comment on sort of how do you feel about how Ubu Web works? Uh, do they agree with that? That's the, the ethical framework that that Goldsmith says he's working under. Uh, do you think that that's ethical? Do you think it's legal? Do you think it should be either or both? Um, I'll just say something briefly. Um, I can't really comment on its legality, but I think it's completely ethical, and um, I teach it. I teach with it. I use it. I recommend that people find something that they like. They try to cat code before it gets taken down, um, <laughs> but. You know, the kind of work that, especially what he is doing, he is not up there like, like trying to find more readers for Robert Frost and T.S. Eliot. He is, he is specifically promoting work that is extremely hard to find otherwise. If it was published in print, it's usually very ephemeral. It goes out of print quickly. Not many copies, hard to find. Some of it is sound poetry that really you need to hear it. Um, and so he has a very specific niche, and he is making things available that are not just not available otherwise. I mean, it was it revolutionized teaching for me when that website went up. Yeah, we um, it must have been about two years ago. We had Kenneth Goldsmith come as a visiting artist and give a lecture at the Corcoran. And just um, by happenstance, that afternoon, as I was giving him a tour of some of the studios, we came into one of the classrooms. There's a classroom um, taught by a gallerist here in town, Jamie McClellan, who um, and she had a guest that day, an uh, um, intellectual property lawyer to come in and to talk to the students about what is fair and what is not. And here we have Kenneth Goldsmith in the back of the room. Put his, and he's a, let's just say, irascible. <laughs> um, um, 
And it was one of those brilliant moments of genuine educational discourse where he, his idea came right up against this attorney. Which the attorney was like, well, you know, we got X, Y, and Z. And Kennedy was like, well, yes, however, we're all artists here. We, we are creators. I mean, this is a great book, Adrian John's Piracy, um, The Intellectual Property Wars from Gutenberg to Gates. Yeah. After you finish it, you can use it as a doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is not new discourse. This is as old as recorded history, these ideas of, of what's fair and what's not. And the writers and the artists have always pushed back. You can make an argument that writing, as Ken Goldsmith does, it's about 50 years behind. In, in visual art, you know, you get uh, Marcel Duchamp and a urinal. Somehow for writers, there's this thing that it makes it more difficult. And in writing, he kind of thinks that, and I agree, that it's um, the equivalent of, I think it's Bruce Andrews is quoted, and it's a great movie, it's on Google Web, called Sucking on Words. Um, difficult to watch, about an hour long. But it um, kind of shows um, Goldsmith's ideas, conceptual poetry itself, and kind of walks you through some of these different, these different moves. Um, <clears throat> You know, one of his main, major, kind of most famous projects probably was called Day. In Day, what, in what he does, he talks about language as a sculptor. He was a sculptor, Ken Goldsmith, at RISD, and he moved into literary practice. But he really thinks of language as material that can be moved and flow into different forms and reframe more. He, he took the edition, I think it's September 1, 2000, the New York Times Metro edition, and OCR'd it and took out all the informational hierarchies, and so every word was the same value. The headlines, the same as the small, the small print and the um, classifieds and all that stuff, and made a book out of it called Day. Okay, so it's nothing, it's, you know, a lot of people, the traditional folks say, Mr. Goldsmith, that's not a poem. And they say, well, yeah, it is. let's go. Let's have this discussion about what poetry is. The actual book is not, he doesn't think that Poetry is necessarily there to be read, to be thought about. And so if you get the idea, you don't have to read the 900-page transcription of day <laughs> to kind of know what's going on in the poem. And it's pretty revolutionary, really. Um, <clears throat> again, it's a widening of practice that I think is so helpful and not thinking that poetry is this one thing that has to fit into a compartment, but a, a sense of language being alive. There's something really bizarre and kind of pernicious and weird thinking about language being owned by somebody. You know, I, I just, in, pre in preparation for this panel, I remember I'm a basketball fan, and I remember that John Calipari had trademarked the phrase, refuse to lose, and Pat Riley, the word 3 P. There's a hilarious <laughs> Wikipedia article about 3 P. how it was actually in this Robert Burns poem, and Pat Riley couldn't have uh, been first there. It reminded me a lot of the discussion we had about fashion earlier today, that uh, with language, it's, we've been there. We're, you know, we share this, these uh, 26 little marks in English and about half a dozen marks of punctuation. Uh, those are ours in a way, right? I mean, that, that's how I go about it. So I don't, uh, again, as I said earlier, thinking about possibility and not limitation for poetry uh, is exciting. I think the digital world has uh, brought all of this new work, this new potentiality uh, to poets. And so again, I mean, just a really, really exciting time. Did you have anything, David? Uh, I met with the poet Wynn Cooper uh, last night, and Wynn had the good fortune of writing a poem that was used in a Sheryl Crow song, All I Want to Do is Have Some Fun, <laughs> became the Sheryl Crow song. Wynn has been living off the royalties of that song for 15 years now. And with the free time that that afforded him, he was able to write subsequent books. Uh, he was able to uh, organize the Brattleboro Literary Festival. And so the protection of intellectual property in that case was, you know, hugely, hugely uh, beneficial. So I think that the key to Ken Goldsmith's site is that it's material that is not readily available, whereas Wynn Cooper's poem and song 
is re readily available, and I think the artist should have uh, the benefits of, uh, of that property. So uh, I want to encourage anyone in the audience who has any questions to Can I just say two words about Ubu and Wealth? A, a few more than two. It's wonderful. It, it's, it, you can get lost there. Uh, and, but the two words I wanted to say were principle seven. Look it up. Um, because the poets that we made the code of best practices had a very, very strong and very affirmative shared view of the status, the appropriate status of, of, of the points of reference, such as Google Web. By contrast, I should say, no one thought that a, um, a popular song setting, let alone an advertising use of poetic material, ought to be treated as a transformative fair use. So you won't find that in the document anyway. So uh, again, want to encourage questions, but um, in the meantime, I'm, I'm, you know, a couple of times, the, I think the phrase benign neglect or the idea that nobody cares when the poor seals and the poorest come up. Uh, it, it, do you see that this changing not just in terms of the, the searchability of, uh, of poems that appear on the web, but also just the availability? I mean, is it, is it a, 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 a silver lining that, uh, that there are forms of distribution um, that aren't small university presses in, uh, in you know, college towns? One, one of the things I, I wonder about and thinking about the fees that literary estates charge and that publishing houses uh, charge, is what's the proper fee in the age of the web for something that can be distributed globally but has a limited audience as poetry does? You know, if the fee is based on the size of the audience, it should be a very nominal fee. But if the fee is based on the fact that the distribution is potentially global, the fee for that should be astronomical. And I don't know the answer to that question. That's why we have public knowledge and uh, this good man here who can help us figure these things out. But I'll also say one thing in, in response to your question. Yeah, I think it helps a lot. I think that the multiplicity of channels that new technology opens up for the circulation of knowledge in general and poetry in particular make a big difference in terms of the practicalities of this field. But there are places where that still where, where the, 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 the writ of the internet does not erupt, let us say. And the most important example of that is, of course, publishing, book publishing. Every critic and many poets have had the experience of encountering publishers who are highly risk averse and who insist, and we've heard these stories in the context of anthologies, but the same stories exist in the context of, of critical studies of, of poetic work. We, we've heard again and again the price tags and the thousands and tens of thousands of dollars which may attach to the unnecessary clearances which, ha which have to be sought, not because the law requires it, but because the publishers require it. So there is really a lot of, I, I agree that the channels of the internet are great, but the, the, the structure of poetic culture still regards the book as something important in its own right. And there is work to be done in clearing away some of the impediments to publishing the kind of valuable poetic and critical work that is now being blocked as a result of either overcautious legal interpretation or simply profound misunderstanding of the doctrine of fair use. Um, speaking about profound misunderstanding of fair use, uh, there's a famous case of um, Paul Zukowski. He's the literary heir of Louis Zukowski. And of course, know this story. Right? Uh, I brought the letter. It's, a, it's right on the top of It's comedy in some ways, but I guess it's kind of horrifying, too. Um, <clears throat> despite, this, is, this is Paul Zukowski in 2009. 
Despite what you may have been told, you may not use L.Z. Lutukowski's words as you see fit, as if you own them, while you hide behind the rubric of fair use. Fair use is a very broadly defined doctrine of which I take a very narrow interpretation, <laughs> and I expect my views to be respected. He goes on to just these horrible threats and this kind of mania condensed in this kind of letter here. Uh, but a very real kind of, kind of chilling effect, and he actually has some, um, you know, really blocked the support of his father's work. His father's work is now harder to read. A lot of the, the work is totally out of print. And here's Paul Zukowski saying, and he's very upfront, like this is economic. My father did this, he set up the estate for me to make money. Tough shit. You know, that, that's, how, that's how we're rolling. Uh, at the very end, Finally, when all else fails and you remain hell-bent on quoting Louis Zukowski, but you really, really, really do not want to deal with me, or you've been stupidly advised to try to circumvent me, remind yourself again and again, and yet once more, what Lyndon Baines Johnson said about J. Edgar Hoover. I'd rather have him inside the tent pissing out than outside pissing in. Quote <laughs> 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 a couple lines in your dad's poem. You know? <laughs> Speaking of quoting, and, and something that came up earlier, uh, I, I, I'm curious because uh, something in, in exchange between Peter and Susan, you were talking about uh, the idea that removing the italics and removing the quotes actually does uh, seem to does you know it, it will more transform the work, the, the quotation and, and more build it into something new. At the same time, I think one of the things that came up in the journalism panel was the idea that a lot of times people aren't upset about copyright law so much as they are upset about credit. Um, how do those how does that how do those two things work together? Yeah that's a really that's a really good question because um, I I couldn't find the book, but I know I've seen more than one book where a poet actually made this into a joke. Like the, like you'd look at a book and there'd be like this much palm and then the rest would be footnotes, only the footnotes would sort of be funny and strange and um, it really became more than half the book. Um, uh, you know, this, you know, poets can sort of um, get in the face of the law with this too because we're such control freaks and even the way we do attribution becomes part of the gesture of the poetics, uh, sometimes not doing it at all. I, I tend to do things like if a poem just relies heavily on one or two sources, I will note that in the back and then otherwise I just have this conglomerate list of what I used and what I relied on and I don't say, you know, on page 32 or in the poem such and such I quoted so and so and I never quote really them. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, the, the question of attribution comes up, and it comes up a lot with teaching. You know, my students have all of these questions, and it's very confusing for students because when you know the first thing they learn about these issues is don't plagiarize. So the first thing they have to do is to figure out when they're sampling and when they're plagiarizing. And we always give them the rule of thumb: is if you want people to know it came from somewhere else, it's sampling, and if you want us to think you wrote it, it's plagiarism. And then we kind of <laughs> then we kind of go from there. Um, and another issue that comes up is whether or not what you are what you are drawing from has been published, and this will come up in communities of writers that have low publication rates, like students, or certain kinds of poetic practice where publication, as we normally think of it, isn't the norm. And what I always say to them is, imagine um, you know Casey wrote a poem, and I heard it, and I really liked it. So as an homage to Casey, I had a couple lines of it in my poem, but then my poem got published first. And his poem comes out, and I think, yeah, Casey stole his lines from Susan. So there's a lot of that kind of issue um, that goes on among contemporaries um, that, that makes attribution difficult. And we try to pose it as a kind of conversation. One of the things that's a conversation among the poets um, who are quoting each other, maybe going back and forth on each other's poems, one of the deepest ironies about Paul Zukowski's position is that the objectivist poets of whom Zukowski was, was a leader Probably the defining person, they had such a sense of community and a sense of cohesiveness and a sense of um, supporting and sort of kibitzing with each other all the time. It just uh, could not be more ironic for one of those poets to be withdrawn by his son from that kind of conversation. So I think we're, we're running up uh, on our time limit. So I'm, I'd like to ask each of the panelists in turn to, to close out with a, a couple of final thoughts. If you have any. Well, I'll go first. Um, I'm just really happy to have heard um, Peter's really strong stance about fair use and what we can do, and I can't wait to 
spread the word. And, and I'll add that I really appreciate what Susan just said about attribution as a conversation. Because if you, when, when you, I hope it's a when, read this document, you'll see that there is a conversation about attribution going on throughout the document, wound in and out of all of the principles. One might sum it up, the, the, the sort of the center of gravity position by saying the poets felt that attribution was extremely important when it made sense to attribute. And that an obligation to attribute, which is of course not present anywhere in the law as such, couldn't extend to situations in which attribution would literally undermine the meaning of purpose of the work. But the conversation is here, and it's a complex one, and I urge you to look at it. It's a great phrase, as is uh, potential rather than possibility rather than constraint, which I'm about to steal Good. Uh, permanently. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of students are not as lucky as Susan's students to be introduced uh, to fair use in a classroom like that. A lot of students, especially grad students, are learning about fair use from their librarians right now because the thesis and the dissertation has become a digital document that's going to be published on the web. And again, uh, there's a kind of chilling effect because universities are very shy about being sued by big corporations. So again, a poet can steal from another poet and it's not going to be flagged by the thesis, you know, maybe reconsider, uh, reconsider the work. Yeah. Um, um, thanks so much. As far as last words, I'd just like to encourage people to realize, especially those who live in Washington, D.C., we're in the midst of a really vibrant um, poetry community that deals with these issues and the work that we make and the work that we perform. We're lucky that we have uh, probably, for my money, the best poetry bookshop in maybe North America at Bridge Street Books, curated by Rob Smith, where you'll find all kinds of stuff that we're talking about. We have a poet coming, Barrett Walton, one of the fathers of language poetry, is reading this Tuesday. And so, uh, read more poetry, buy poetry books. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> so, I'd like to thank you.